Hello, everyone, and welcome to phyloseminar.org. The current theme is building phylogenetic networks, and this is the second talk in a series of three talks on that topic. Please use the YouTube live comment box to ask questions. Today's speaker is Dr. Vincent Moulton, who is professor in computational biology at University of East Anglia. After completing his PhD at Duke University, he has worked as a researcher at University of Bielefeld, University of Canterbury, Mass University, Mid-Sweden University, Uppsala University, and now University of East Anglia. His research interests include phylogenetics, computational biology of RNA, short RNAs, metagenomics, algorithms in bioinformatics, and discrete structures such as graphs and finite metric spaces. Welcome, Vince, and thank you for participating. Great. Thanks very much, Eric. So uh, it's very nice to have the opportunity to speak today. Um, so my talk today will be possibly a little bit uh, theoretical in nature, but I'll try and sort of keep the uh, uh, try and sort of do it with lots of examples to keep it simple. Um, so yeah, I'd be, but before I start, I'll just mention that it's this is of course all joint work with several people, but some of the key people are Andrew Francis. Uh, who's at University of West Sydney, um, Leo Van Israel, Momoko Heya, Misu, Katerina Huber, Yukihiro, or Yuki Marakami, and Charles Semple, and Terry Ang Wu. And I'd like to thank also the Netherlands Organization of Scientific Research, the Kyoto University, and London Mathematical Society for providing some money to go visit all those people. So, um, yeah, so I'll just briefly give you a plan for the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about phylogenetic combinatorics. Then we'll talk about the um, problem of reconstructing phylogenetic networks from distances. Then we'll talk a bit about encoding the networks. And if time permits, so I know Eric's keen, I spend 50 minutes. So if I'm running out of time, I'll probably skip over this last bit. But if I have time, I'll talk a bit about consensus networks and, of course, some future directions. So, yeah, let's begin. So what, what do we mean by a uh, uh, phylogenetic tree? Yeah. So it's basically, uh, uh, from a mathematical point of view, it's a simple connected graph with no cycles, and its leaf set corresponds to some set of species here. So here the species would be A through E, maybe it's uh, cats, dogs, humans, etc., or whichever species you like. Okay. And, and what in phylogenetic combinatorics, what we're interested in is looking at ways to manipulate, understand the mathematical properties of phylogenetic trees and related structures. Okay. So we sort of think about this central thing that we're interested in here, uh, phylogenetic trees, and Somehow, when we look at a phylogenetic tree and we want to actually do something with it, we need ways to handle it, okay? So there's sort of, you can see in this little diagram, we can go from a phylogenetic tree to a quartet, to some quartets or splits or metrics, okay? So maybe some of you aren't familiar with all of these terms, so I'll just briefly explain, yeah? So if we're given a phylogenetic tree like this, we can define a metric or a distance uh, on, on the leaf set, okay? Uh, that, and, and to do that, we could say, take two leaves, A and E, and we could look at how many edges do I have to cross on the on the shortest path or the unique path between A and E. So here we've got one, two, three, four edges, okay? So then we can define a, a matrix uh, on A, B, C, D, etc. Where we just fill in, well, distance between A and A is zero, B and B is zero, etc. It's going to be a symmetric matrix, so we don't really care about what happens below there, on the below the diagonal, and then we fill in the distances. Yeah, so A and B would be one, two, three, four again, okay, etc. Okay, so in this little diagram that I just drew, you know, I've just explained how we can go from a phylogenetic tree into a metric on the leaf set, okay? Well, we could also um, think of another um, very sort of commonly used idea for phylogenetic trees, uh, which is to look at the splits that we get from the tree. 
Okay, so the splits now will be uh, given by taking uh, an edge and cutting it, okay? And if we cut it, then we see that we get a split of the leaf set now again, uh, say A and D, versus what's left, which is C, E, and B, okay? So here, uh, given this phylogenetic tree, we will get a set of splits, actually, okay? For each edge, we get a split. So here we'll get one, two, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven splits, okay? So in this example now, we've taken our fire tree and we've turned it, say, into a set of splits. So that's another way to think about um, trees or encoding trees, okay? A final way that's commonly uh, looked at uh, is quartet. So now we'll look at every four leaves. Let's just take these four, for example, and then we see that this, if we look at the, the subtree spanned by those four leaves, uh, and then forget that, and then forget this little thing here, then we get a quartet, as it's called. So that's a four-leaved phylogenetic tree, okay, in this example. So we could turn it into, uh, this tree, into a bunch of quartets, okay? So in, in this um, little diagram then, we start with a phylogenetic tree and we can go to a metric or a metric or a split, a set of splits or a bunch of quartets. And when we, but what we're interested in usually is that, uh, how can we actually reconstruct a phylogenetic tree from these types of objects here? So if I give you a bunch of quartets or splits or metrics, how can I get back or reconstruct, or can I reconstruct my phylogenetic tree from that uh, set that I've associated to it? So just as an example, let's think about how, uh, how we might go from a, a set of splits to a, a phylogenetic tree. So I'm interested in, in this direction here. Okay, so suppose um, I, uh, so I, I've given this set of splits, and maybe the first set split I want to consider uh, to is, say, AD, and um, the rest, which is uh, CEB. Okay, so how could I, uh, how could I introduce this new split? So I could look at, I could look at D and A. I could sort of look at that tree spanned by those, and I could look at the tree spanned by the rest of those elements, okay? And you can see these uh, two subtrees now that I've drawn. Maybe I should use another color, but they intersect on precisely one vertex. So what I can do is sort of look at this little vertex in here and I can split it out, okay? I'll make a new edge by splitting or popping out this uh, tree, that's why it's called tree popping. And so it goes back to uh, Meacham from some years ago in the 80s, okay? So I've introduced a new split into, I've started with basically all of the, with a, with a star tree. I've introduced a new split, and now maybe I want to put in another split, EB versus the rest. Okay, so I wonder if I can get this thing to work. Um, yeah, maybe we use another color. So if I look at now EB and I look at, say, the other part, which is A, D, C, then again, they overlap on a vertex. And I can now split apart that vertex and out comes my tree. So I've, so, you know, I've started, essentially, I've started with two splits and I've popped them out and made my fire jack tree. So I've re so if I give if I'm if you gave me this tree at the start, I could look at its two splits. Okay. And then I can reconstruct that tree from that set of splits by popping it out. Interestingly, um, you might not want to stop there though. You might say, well, I, I've got I'm looking at my data, okay, and, and I've got this. Sort of set of splits that I've represented now by a tree, and maybe 
there's some um, sort of signal in the data which says that I want to also consider this split looks like it's got a good signal too, okay? So A, B, E, C, D, all right? So we could look at now, play the same trick, yeah? So we could look at the subtree here, A, B. And if I can get this color to work, we can look at this part spanned on the rest here. Okay, and now you can see that I've actually that the sort of intersection now of these two uh, convex sort of sets or span convex subtrees here uh, is actually a whole uh, line. There we go. And so now I could play the same ga game and I could pop that out. And now I've represented that new split. But as you can obviously see, that new graph that I've got is no longer a tree. So that would be actually what's called a, an example of a phylogenetic network. It's a special kind of net phylogenetic network called a split network because actually each of these um, sets of parallel edges represents a different split okay and this set of splits even though it no longer will fit into a tree can still be represented nicely in its network so I'm sort of revisiting this diagram that um i had before sort of like this core idea in, in um uh, phylogenetic combinatorics we're interested in now if we're given phylogenetic trees or networks uh how we can sort of uh encode them by go, you know turning them into objects you know, either splits metrics cortex or whatever you like and then of course we want to be able to go back and we're interested in therefore the reconstruction problem which is what this talks all about reconstructing um, these things so yeah so there are sort of basically a few quite a few interesting reconstructability questions but um uh, I mean, what I've just explained here is that when can we actually reconstruct a tree or a network from some sort of encoding? And, and can we actually characterize encodings that correspond to phyllic trees or networks, for example? So, uh, so for example, uh, uh, hopefully many of you might be aware of uh, Booneman's theorem, which says that if you're given a collection of splits and every pair of them satisfies a certain pairwise compatibility um, uh, condition, which I won't say now, then actually that set of splits must correspond to uh, a phylogenetic tree. So those, those are kind of quite, those are kind of key questions that we're interested in, in uh, phylogenetic combinatorics and reconstructing, reconstructability in, in phylogenetic networks. Uh, and of course, you might say, well, why should I care about these things? I think it's a very reasonable question. Well, um, they, they, they basically give us useful data structures, for example, to manipulate trees and networks, encodings. Um, they can be used as a basis for methods and algorithms for building trees and networks. So as we just saw, the tree popping algorithm gives us a nice way to build up a tree from splits. So you can imagine you start with maybe your favorite, say, sequence alignment, maybe you're looking at mitochondrial data. You gather a collection of splits from your alignment, and then you could use sort of tree popping and its extension to networks to build up some kind of split network or median network, as they're sometimes called. Um, and of course, neighbor joining, that takes as its input distance matrices. So but being at, understanding how um, or under what circumstances matrices or splits, etc., do actually correspond to trees gives us good uh, ideas for building um, these uh, structures, which of course we're all very interested in. And and, and they're often um, these encodings also often form the basis for sort of global getting global understandings of trees and networks. So if you know a little bit about tree spaces um, and you're interested, for example, the cat zero property, this all comes out essentially from pairwise compatibility and trying to understand how trees are encoded by splits. 
and, and, and something that I like anyway, and hopefully some of you might, is I think some of the mathematics that comes out from understanding these things is quite nice to do and interesting. Okay. So now I'm going to move on then to um, sort of uh, the sort of main object of interest in this talk, which are unrooted phylogenetic networks. So we're going to generalize now uh, phylogenetic trees. Yeah? So this is a nice example of an unrooted phylogenetic network. Because uh, I don't want to have to keep saying unrooted all the time, we'll just call it a phylogenetic network. Uh, the reason why I'm calling it unrooted, though, is that there's a lot of interest at the moment also in rooted phylogenetic networks where you have some kind of directions on the edges. And in this example, but for these networks today, we won't worry about directions. OK, so what is this um, uh, phylogenetic network? It's a simple connected graph. And in, for, for the moment, anyway, for the time being, I'm going to assume that all vertices have degree one or three. And there's going to be a leaf set again, corresponding to a set of species. So obviously, uh, a phylogenetic tree will satisfy these conditions. Only for it to be a phylogenetic tree, it would also have to have no cycles. And here you can see that the reason why this is not a phylogenetic tree, for example, is that we have the cycle in here. Okay. So as with phylogenetic trees, we can get distances from networks clearly. We can just say, okay, let say I want to look at the distance between A and D, for example. Now I have to be a little bit more careful because I obviously I could, you know, I could go like this, I could go like that, and I could look at a path from A to D. But of course, if I want to actually get a distance, normally, as you would say if you're looking in the in the Euclidean plane, you'll want to find a shortest distance between those two vertices. So, uh, you know, so for it, so in this example, we would call the distance between A and D will be the length of the shortest path between those two. So here, I think, if I remember, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so we can clearly we can Given any phylogenetic network, we can again make a distance matrix. And the question then becomes the reconstructability question becomes when can we uniquely reconstruct a phylogenetic network from its distance matrix? Okay, so I give you, so here we got the little distance matrix for this phylogenetic network on the right. Uh, so, for example, you can see that the distance between A and B is three because the shortest. Uh, path has three edges mm -hmm. and, and of course uh, the question and and what we're worried about is well okay firstly if I give you this distance matrix can you get back this network and, and is it the only network which has that uh, distance matrix okay so that was some work with Leo and Yuki that we did uh, a, a year or two ago and we found that there were some nice um, examples there. So, uh, but maybe I just go back off the. Um, first of all, I should mention that trees, you know, if you give me a phylogenetic tree, I can always get back uh, the tree uniquely from its distance matrix. And in fact, that was already shown in 1965. Okay, so this is uh, uh, not, <laughs> not necessarily a new problem, but interestingly, uh, people haven't really studied the, the network variance that much until much more recently. Um, so what I want to now do is look at sort of classes, a sort of very natural class of network so that I can explain our results. Yeah? So we've got this idea of a level K network. And what we'll do is we define a blob in a network is a maximal two connected subgraph with at least three vertices. So uh, two connected means that if you rem if you rem you cannot remove a vertex and disconnect it. Okay, so here, for example, uh, let's look at the, what the blobs are here. I mean, if you if you're not too happy with a lot of mathematical notation, I mean, this is a blob because uh, you know I can't if I take away any vertex, it doesn't disconnect that thing. Okay, and it's 
and there's no larger subgraph that would have that property. And here's another plot as it is with that edge. So we've got here we've got two blobs, as they call, and we'll call a network level K if at most K edges must be removed from each blob to uh, obtain a tree. So for this example, uh, this would be in the you know in a level two network because here to for, for this little blob here to make this thing so essentially to make this network into a tree i'd have to if i remove this edge i've still got this piece do a cycle okay so i have to say cut another one and in here if i cut this edge okay i get now a tree so this is a this is what i would call a, a level two network okay so level one networks then are uh, nice because the blobs are just cycles okay and um what we showed was that every level one network can be reconstructed uniquely from its distance matrix okay but uh, already when we get to level two we're not able to reconstruct them from their distance matrix okay so uh, i mean I'm, i haven't time to check all of the distances here, but if you had a if you had to a minute or two, you can take a look at these two networks. They give exactly the same distance on the on the set A, B, C, D, but I think you can hopefully see that these two networks are not isomorphic, okay? Because here we've got A B poking off this cycle here. And uh, over here, AB is hanging off this thing with a, a sort of uh, part here with uh, this cycle with a with an edge added. Okay, so these are not these are not isomorphic as they're not equivalent as phylogenetic networks, but they give exactly the same distance. So at that point, you think to yourself, well, this is this looks a bit um, unpleasant, but uh, and we started to think then a bit more about, well, how could you make, so we can't really encode these things anymore with distances. Maybe if we were allowing ourselves uh, to record a little bit more about the structure through distances, we could say more, we thought, okay? So this looks a little bit complicated, but what we're interested in now is we're going to say for every pair of points, say A and B, we won't look at uh, just, uh, the um, uh, uh, we'll look at all possible uh, distances between um, A and B. Okay, so here we get the shortest distance, but here we get three. But here we could also have gone like this to A and B. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So now we're going to actually get what's called a, a multi set of distances. So for each pair of leaves, We've got different ways to get between the leaves, different paths, and they give us different lengths. And suppose now we were given not just the shortest distance between every pair of leaves, but we were given this kind of multi-set, as we call it. And so it's a sort of set of all possible uh, path lengths between the two leaves. Maybe that'll be enough to reconstruct the networks. And indeed, we were able to show that level two networks are reconstructable from their multi set distance. And I think I'd like to mention that um, a little while ago now, uh, it's been, there's some more work come out on this, but a little while ago, Charles Semple and uh, Magnus Borderich had this really nice um, paper where they were looking at rooted phylogenetic networks and they showed a sort of similar kind of uh, result on um, a sort of class of rooted networks where they were thinking, yeah, okay, what if I'm given not just the shortest distance, but several distances? And, that, and they showed, yeah, you can actually then get back things. Of course, you could then wonder, well, if I've got real data, how will I ever get a multi-set of distances out? And that, I think, still remains as a little bit of an open problem, to be honest. Uh, so... And we thought, okay, this is great. Now, what about level three? And immediately we could find uh, an example now of a level of level three networks that we can't reconstruct from their moldy set of distances. So here we have um, 
again it's a very similar style of example from before we've we've got a here with this blob this is now level three because you have to remove three edges from this blob to be able to get it back down to a tree and here a is adjacent to a different blob different non-isomorphic blob in the other network but they give exactly the same um multi-sectnicities okay so um so you know it, I, I i kind of main reason i wanted to show you this was to show you some nice what i think intuitive examples of the kind of uh, problem of encoding fiber networks and the sort of issues that can arise okay we could of course uh, switch now if we wanted we could consider edge weighted networks right so um you know obviously when we look at fire trees normally when we're doing at least um uh, we're working with real data we give edge weights to all of the um, edges in the in the tree and here we could do the same with fire networks we in this little network here we've given each uh, edge a weight and we could still look at things like shortest paths etc uh, and and with um uh, Yuki and Momoko Hayamitsu, uh, we were we showed a little while ago that actually if you look at weighted level one uh, networks, and in fact even uh, something more complicated, something called a, an X cactus, which we'll come back to, then actually we can always um, reconstruct those um, from their distance uh, matrices. So that's um, quite nice. Um, but intriguingly, if you get to uh, level two networks now and you put weights on those, then you can't uh, reconstruct them from their, even, even, you know, if you've got a weighted network and you take the shortest path distances, again, you can't reconstruct them. So uh, in this example here, this was an interesting example um, by a guy called Altifer that appeared in 1988 he wasn't thinking about actually uh fire jet networks he was thinking about um something called tight spans uh, which are very closely related to fire jet networks but this is this essentially is an example of a phylogenetic network it looks a bit odd because the leaves now uh, are not not what we typically look at we're, we don't you know we're not thinking about this as a leaf now but you know we could just imagine that we can give that leaf length uh, that pendant edge length zero okay and it works out for every epsilon between 0.5 and minus 0.5 um, we always get the same metric from that network okay so it doesn't matter you know we can sort of vary this thing and we can't we can't get back exactly the weighted level two network from its distance So there's actually quite a lot of interesting still, you know, this is this is sort of in some sense, although it's been a couple of papers, there's still quite a lot of open questions there, I think, that could be quite fun to, to look at. We need to really understand these things quite a lot more. Uh, we have to get a better understanding of these things. So, um, so that's sort of uh, just to give you an idea about uh, reconstructing networks. So now I'm going to actually uh sort of turn a little bit to the other question that i asked earlier on i said okay can we actually characterize when an encoding uh, the the encodings are, uh, arise from different classes of networks so for example if i give you um a set of splits as i mentioned earlier and that set of splits is pairwise compatible then i know it must correspond to a unique phylogenetic tree so uh, sort of, but and all of this stuff, as I said, has been kind of worked out in some detail ooh, from the at least from the 1970s by people like Peter Boonham and uh, Meacham uh, and many other uh, people who've worked on this. But uh, in some sense, this is still, I think, quite new territory in phylogenetic network land. Okay, so what I'm going to just to give you an example, I'm going to think about go, go to think about quartets. And we're going to go back to it, but we're now thinking about networks, okay? So 
Uh, some of you might be aware or have heard about this idea of, a, of quartet inference, okay? So suppose we're given two little quartet trees here. Uh, and we said, okay, if, suppose I'm looking at some data set, maybe on four taxa, and, uh, and I had an alignment, maybe it was split into two, and I'm, on these two parts, I got two different trees, yeah? Now, I, but the trees now are on different uh, sets, yeah? So we've got A, B, C, D, A, C, D, E. Now, if you, looked at, if you look at the example uh, A, what the, the leaves they have in common, so they have A, C, and D, and A, C, and D, and this one, okay? Then I think by staring at this, you realize you look at this ACD and you can see that E uh, pops out of the D uh, pendant edge here, okay? So in fact, if we look over it now, if we look at um, this uh, on the other tree, we know that E must come out from here. And therefore we can, in, we can infer, for example, if we now look at this tree here, A, uh, C, uh, D, and E. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we can infer, or and this one here, of course. Then we could infer, for example, A, B, uh, C, and E must exist. So if I've given these sort of two overlapping quartet trees, it sort of infers another uh, quartet tree. In fact, it infers three other quartet trees. We could have a, B, C, E, we could have um, A, B, E, D, uh, etc. So we get what's called a, a sort of what's known in the trade as a, a dyadic inference rule. So we're given a pair of quartets and this sort of infers an additional quartet. And in, in, this, in this example, three additional quartets. OK, so these inference rules are very closely related to uh, encodings and and they've been studied for some time and uh, there's an idea of a closure semi-dyadic closure so what you do is you start with a set of quartets let's call it q and we'll call it semi-dyadic closure it's the smallest set of quartets that contains q and it has a property that if you have any pair of quartets in here, yeah, like I've just drawn on the last slide, if I've got A, B, C, D, and A, C, D, E, then these other three quartets are implied. They must also be in there. Okay? So the semi dyadic closures, the smallest set of quartets with a nice property that if you've got any pair that overlap on these three here, then you must have the other ones inside of that. And the interesting result that in, in essence goes back to Colonius and Shorts in 1981 and, and others, of, I, I, I couldn't list them all now, but um, is a, it's a nice little theorem which says, okay, if you're given a collection of quartet trees on X and, and you're given one on each four subset of X, okay, then Q is displayed by a phylogenetic tree if and only if its semi dyadic closure is equal to itself. Okay, so this, this can be re regarded as a characterization for when a set Q is an encoding for a phylogenetic tree. So um, you could then say, well, let's um, not be too ambitious. Maybe we'll look at level one networks, okay? And we could start maybe to play around and see whether we can do something with cortex for these networks, okay? So remember, level one network simply meant that every blob is a cycle, okay? So here's a nice little level one network. And we can, of course, still see cortex in here, yeah? I mean, we could, for example, look at... Um, a, D, and maybe, I don't know, we could say H and E. Oh, sorry, not A, D. C, D, H, and E, okay? 
uh, or, or we could uh, now, of course, it's slightly different because we've got uh, a phylogenetic network, so we're going to get quartets. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, I got, I could cut like that, and then I could have a quartet would be something like um, A, C, B, and H, yeah. So, you know, basically, you can still squeeze out a set of quartets from uh, a level one network. Uh, and then you might say, well, maybe we can do this kind of nice uh, dyadic closure again. Maybe something nice might pop out. But um, you might say, can I characterize dense sets of quartets? So that dense just means that on every four subset, I must have a quartet. Suppose I want to characterize dense sets of quartets that correspond to level one networks in a similar way. Can we do that? And um, interestingly, a, guy, a couple of guys, Kaisper, oops, uh, Kaisper and Pendavdig in 2014, they had a look at that and they said, oh, no, I don't, they, they said, I can't, we can't, obviously, we can't um, see how to do this because at least the dyadic rule does not hold for level one. So in this example here, um, we have the quartets A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. A, B, <coughs> C, and D. All right, we have that quartet because we've got this split here, basically. And we've got A, C, and D, and E. Okay. Because we've got this. So we get the A, C... We get A, C, D, and E, but we now no longer have this other thing that we should have from dyadic inference. We don't see the quartet anymore, A, B, C, E. Okay, so at this point they said, okay, we've got to stop now. Um, but um, it was kind of, to be honest, this is something that I found out after I started already working on this with Charles and Talian and Katty, but, um, but, but, Sort of a nice way around this, at least, is to say not necessarily now to look at quartets, but to look at something which we call uh, core nets. Okay, and this this actually came this comes about a little bit of history that came about that name came about because long a little while ago, Katie and I, Katarina Hoover and I, thought about something called tri nets, um, which are sort of so what are those? So those are four leaf phylogenetic networks, you know, the obvious thing that you would try and look at, okay? Uh, so you can induce from, say, this level one network, you can get out some core nets. So, for example, if I look at A, C, H, and G, and then I look at, okay, I say, okay, well, this, this, this must be, you know, we get this little thing here, maybe. So we could look at all part, the spanning uh, sub-network but of course if we do that we've got this kind of weird thing here where we've got a, a sort of something like this so what we'll do is we'll well we'll um if we see anything with degree two we'll ignore that and then sort of we'll reduce that to something like this and then of course we get a, a sort of a, a multi-edge so it wouldn't be a simple graph so we'll squash that down to an edge so when we've sort of played that game and squashed down everything that uh, is either, because here we get a degree two vertex, but once we've squashed everything down, we get, we induce a core net from there. And if we look at the other one here, I've got, we get regular cortex too, yeah, because you've got, if you look at A, B, C, D, then in this example, when we define all this, well, this kind of little thing disappears. So. Okay, so we can induce a set of core nets from there and then what was quite um fun is a uh, so we get back to that bit where mathematics is fun um was that we were able then to realize that we could still get inference rules but now on core nets so in this little inference rule here we have something like a b uh, c and this is going to be a pain to see but anyway if we look now at a b c here Uh, then, then uh, here we'll. Well, I, I won't go through it all now, but you, this, this will, this basically 
if you look at very carefully at this, you'll see that this pushes out uh, a D onto here, and then we get essentially it infers in a similar way before it infers this uh, from these pair of core nets. We get out an inferred new core net. Okay, so we can write down these. Um, we can write down core net inference rules like these illustrated examples here. And um, we do get now a rather nice result, which says that if you're given a collection now of core nets, one for every four subset of X, then we can actually characterize when it um, uh, is uh, displayed by a level one network. And again, it, we can define we can define a generalization of the semi dyadic closure in the obvious way using these rules. And then we need some other little extra condition here. So it's essentially the equivalent of this um, result I mentioned just a few minutes ago, except for now we need this other little thing which says it's consistent on three subsets. So what that means is that you might get something like this, A, B, C, and, and you've got A, B, C, okay? And you want to make sure when you write down your set of core nets, so every time you see A, B, C, with a little cycle on it, like here in in the set, then you always see that. You don't see these sort of two uh, situations simultaneously. Obviously, if you saw those both at the same time, then you wouldn't be consistent. You wouldn't be able to display both of those simultaneously on any uh, level one network. That's, that's a that really nice result. Can you just go back? It's like the dyadic closure for these yeah. core nets doesn't seem quite as obvious as it does for quartets. Yes, so. it's it's a little bit more um, uh, demanding. I agree. So um, maybe we'll look at maybe we'll have a look at this one. See if I can. The trouble is, I'm trying to draw this on the screen, and I haven't maybe done such a nice job. So if I look at say, in this example, I look at um, A, C, and D. Okay, the overlap. So I've got. I've got A, C, and D here, and in this one I get A, C, and D. Right, so now on this example you can see that, um, yeah, so uh, we've got, so E must lie on the, op so you see this E here, yeah, that must lie on the sort of opposite side of where the, you've got A, D, and C, so you've got this You've got a, a, C, and D, yeah. So E must lie on the sort of part. You've got this cycle between with A and D, and E lies on that side of the um, the opposite side from where C lies. Okay. So over here, that implies that E must lie here because we we see this kind of copy of this here. You know, we've got we've got this A, C, and D, and so therefore E now must lie on the opposite side from where C lies on the two paths between A and D. Do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. The point is that you these are the core cornet uh, inference rules, and they're sufficient to like that's right handle all the cases, and they're sort of. They're basically axioms, and then that's right. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, those are the ones that we need. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so that what slightly yeah. So you, yeah, uh, and I, I don't. I'm not sure. To be honest, I can't remember. But I don't think this is the complete set. These are sort of examples of a couple more of the more of the. You know, you've got the usual. I, I can't remember exactly if this is the complete set. Okay, to be honest. But um, I just wanted to sort of illustrate them. But there is a sort of finite list of this nature. Okay, so, um, yeah, so this leaves actually some quite nice open problems that I haven't really looked at much. Because um, we could talk about sets of quartets that define phylogenetic trees, okay? So in all of these examples, I've been a bit sneaky, and I've always taken a quartet on every four subset or a core net on every four subset. But if you can you can have examples where you have um, sort of, uh, let's look at this example. So here we have a phylogenetic tree and I have now, uh, I've 
got four quartets that are displayed by this tree. So you can see we've got the quartet A, B, C, F, for example. Okay, so here we get, um, we've got four quartets and every one of those you can see within that tree. And now this set, you can clearly see, doesn't it's not um, one quartet for every four subset because I've only got four quartets, okay? But this defines this tree actually because this is the only phylogenetic tree that actually displays that set of quartets. And there are some really lovely results, you know, phylogenetic common sorts if you like, uh, results uh, on what's called definitive sets of quartets. Uh, people like Charles, uh, Mike Steele, Andreas Stress, Stefan Grunewald, which I've just given a nice little example here of a paper by Stefan Grunewald, where they sort of can say things about um, definitive sets, uh, but I, I, we haven't done anything yet on um, core nets. And I think that that actually looks quite complicated because what happens is it's a bit like mixing up um, trees and cycles. It's sort of like a sort of a crazy combination and things don't seem to work so nicely on cycles. So I think, you know, I'd be really interested to see if there, anyone had the, uh, some, uh, wanted to attack some problems there. Now, I have, uh, according to my clock, I have five minutes left. Eric, would you like me to stop now and just run to the end, or do you want me to just go through briefly the last topic? Maybe, maybe just a, I mean, you've done such a great job. But maybe just a, a just a quick overview, okay. if it's possible to set yeah, up. a quick overview of the last topic, or just yeah, the yeah, okay. So this is this is about something called consensus networks, and I'll go a little bit faster, but you may stop me, Eric, if you're getting. I, I'll do my best. So. We all know about consensus trees, I think. So you're given a set of phylogenetic trees and you want to actually then uh, summarize them by a single tree. And you could ask the same for networks. Okay. So how, how do you do, what's one way to do that for um, phylogenetic trees? Well, in fact, now I'm gonna look at something called X trees. So an X tree is, is essentially a phylogenetic tree, only now we allow some internal labels. Okay, so here's a phylogenetic, here's an X tree. And now we're going to have some internally labeled nodes. And in fact, essentially, we'll, we'll allow any labeling we like, but we must always have degree. So we'll never have a degree two node that's not labeled. But as long as we have a tree where every degree two or one node or one node is labeled, then that's an X tree. OK, so how can if we're given the set of X trees, we can um, actually give a partial ordering on that set. Um, as follows. So if I look at that branch now, it's a bit like reverse tree popping. Uh, I can squash it down and I'll get a new X tree. And of course, I could keep squashing everything down, all of the edges down until I get a vertex actually labeled by everything. And this gives a partial ordering, okay? So we'll say that two X trees, one's less than the other. If the set of splits of T is a subset of the set of splits of T prime. OK, so this is where we're really using the fact that splits are an encoding, not just for phylogenetic trees, but for X trees. And that, that gives a nice partial order on the set of phylogenetic trees. And the interesting thing, uh, so what are the maximal elements? Those are the ones which um, sort of you can't split out, you can't pop them out any further. And now those are binary phylogenetic trees and the minimal element as I said, or actually hinted at, is, a, is oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about X trees, uh, is actually going to be a vertex where we just squash everything down to uh, a point. It isn't quite right what I've written there. So how do we, so what's, okay, I said I wanted to do something to do with consensus networks, consensus trees, so what's that got to do with partial ordering? So um, what's nice is if you want to take the strict consensus of a set of phylogenetic network, phylogenetic, a set of phylogenetic X trees, what you do is you take the set of splits that are contained in all of the tree, all the trees. So you you look at your you look at all your trees, and you look at the set of splits where each, that's every element in that set has to be a split in every tree. Uh, and 
this is actually uh, nothing other than the greatest lower bound for the set under this partial order. Okay, so interestingly, to get you know, the one way to think about um, uh, consensus trees, at least strict consensus trees, is you get a partial order and then you look for greatest lower bounds. Okay, and that was a nice observation in Mike Steele's book, um, uh, Mike and Charles' uh, book. Uh, from 2004. So um, yeah, so what we're, what we're going to be interested in is finding the, con the consensus of a bunch of X cactuses. So uh, an X cactus again is basically a connected, it's a level one network, but it's a connected graph in which every pair of cycles in a set at most, in at most one vertex. So it's like a level one network, but you are allowed again to have these kind of degree two modes. It's a bit like the equivalent of a of an X level one network, okay? And you've got a labeling map whose image contains all vertices with degree at most two. I, I won't go into this. So one way you might try and do this is you say, oh, can I uh, do sort of emulate what we do to find a consensus for a bunch of X cactuses? Maybe what I could do is do some sort of partial ordering in terms of their splitting codings. So we can look, so, you know, we could, each cycle gives them a bunch of splits, okay? We get splits from edges, we get splits from cycles too. But one problem that um, you face when you do that is uh, um, if we look at this thing here, we've got a bunch of splits. Okay? Uh, if I wanna, um, if I remove say uh, this split here, then it doesn't actually, then I still, even though I've got a different set of splits, it's still, I'm still getting the same X cactus. I'm not, nothing's disappearing in my X cactus, okay? So the splits didn't feel like quite the right way to define a nice partial ordering on X cactuses. So having looked at that um, with Andrew, Francis and Katie, when we had a nice trip to Australia a couple of years ago, we realized that one way that we might be able to do to, to do this is to look at something called, so to look at partitions, okay? So, so just to say briefly, so if you're given this cycle here, you can imagine I could look, I've got a four cycle, I can look at these pieces, okay? And then I get a partition, I get E, B, uh, F, K, and all the rest, G, you know, A, H, D, G, H, okay? So I get a, instead of a bipartition, a split, I get a four partition. And there's one important thing though, this isn't just a straight, um, it isn't a straight uh, partition in the normal sense because there's an ordering on the way that you have the parts, yeah? So you've got to have, so each cycle here gives me a partition plus an ordering. This is what we call a circular partition. And what we showed in this little um, preprint here is that actually uh, you can encode an X cactus by a set of circular partitions. So that's sort of like a, the equivalent of a, of a split, a Booneman theorem for splits for X cactuses. And then we can put a partial ordering where now uh, to go sort of go from one X cactus to another, we can sort of contract an edge just like with trees and then what will happen to the partition? So if we've got this partition here, then this will this will correspond in the circular partition to sort of squashing down two parts into a single part, okay? So we get this nice partial ordering now on X axis. And of course we can then start to say what, uh, what we mean by a consensus uh, network because we'll just again play that same trick we'll look at the greatest lower bounds in this partial ordering <laughs> um but then things get more complicated <laughs> so the, they, they might not be unique um i won't go through uh, and all sorts of little nasty things happen so we do get consensus networks you know in principle for x cactuses and level one networks uh but um, we haven't been able to find, a, um, we can characterize these greatest lower bounds, but we haven't actually been able to decide if there's an efficient way to even find one. 
okay so there's one thing to define it and to show yeah this is interesting but how can we compute it efficiently um and maybe this isn't the best way i could imagine to find a consensus for a set of x cases are there other ways so there's all sorts of i think fascinating open problems there um so i'm i've definitely run out of time i'll just say that um in terms of future directions then so hopefully if you've enjoyed this talk a little bit you'll agree that phylogenetic combinatorics as we sort of call it is a nice um area so we've we've kind of explored quite a bit today these kind of arrows going to and from uh, phylogenetic networks and these things and uh, now we could also add partitions in here if we wanted you know not just splits um we could have that in there so then this little triangle might get bigger but there's what we when we wrote the book some while ago um andreas dress katty jack Kuhlman, andreas spiel and myself on fire jack combinatorics the thing that i didn't really talk about today is that you have um you also have these arrows so you know the, where you can jump now not only between not only in and out between trees networks and splits metrics and cortex but you could sort of go between encodings yeah so you could go directly between splits and metrics this is a this is all basically the this arrow here is all to do with something called split decomposition theory okay so each one of these blue arrows actually is a nice little topic in its own right how to get between these things and and in terms of phylogenetic networks i think they're basically completely unexplored so uh, i think that's that, that that would be really interesting to look at moving between encodings uh yeah and, and then of course uh what i haven't talked about today um but this all sort of still fits in this framework are rooted phylogenetic networks and trees and there are lots of really nice um results about rooted encodings of rooted phylogenetic networks um, which I you know simply don't have time to discuss today I think that there's loads of really interesting problems there still to be worked out so so really I think that's uh, all I wanted to say so thanks very much for your attention today thank you Vince uh, that was a really I mean you know of course that's pretty technical material but you did a great job like making it accessible great thanks very much um, so you mentioned tight spans uh, as mm -hmm. sort of one one way in which this touches the rest of mathematics. But I'm sort of just wondering, uh, I mean, are each of these phylogenetic theorems like sort of a, or these questions, are they sort of a world unto themselves or do they connect with other branches of math? That's a, a, a good question. Um, so f like, as I think I mentioned earlier on, um, if you look at encodings of phylogenetic trees with splits you get tree spaces okay i mean now uh, these tree spaces are uh, are sort of examples of, i guess as you probably know of cat zero spaces and there's all sorts of nice connections between um cat zero spaces and um uh, you know all sorts of geometric questions that you can look at there and, and recently um together with a couple of colleagues megan um owen and uh, Catherine St. John, we've been looking at um, looking at sort of network spaces, and we've managed to, I think, come up with quite a nice way to extend to um, cat zero results to at least rooted level one networks. And of course, then we get all these connections with, um, you know, with all of that sort of geometry, or, or if you want to go in a different direction, many of these things to do with, say, the Boonerman split um you know if you look at split theory then you do indeed you get a whole lot of very interesting re relationships with l1 theory yeah, and l1 embeddings and 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 also um not nice connections with uh it just went out of my head um well, i'm sure it'll come back to me but but i mean to cut, well, I mean, you've got all these things like delta hyper, but you know, there's really a lot of, you know, oh yeah, median algebras and all sorts of. So, in a sense, yes, you're uh, each one of these little pieces is a kind of, I, I kind of call it almost um, uh, mathematics with labels. Okay, 
So um, a lot of people have spent years and years studying, for example, median graphs and fascinating things. And now we look at something called, you know, we started looking a long time ago at something called Booneman graphs, and they're, they're essentially median graphs with, with labels, okay? And so I think in a broader sense, we're really looking just at mathematical problems, and many times these bounce back to have all sorts of interconnections with previous problems, but, but maybe more, sometimes more special and sometimes more general, actually. Does that kind of help a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, want, I did want to encourage people to post questions if they have them um, in the YouTube live comment box. I have one other question, though, uh, sure. yeah. which is um, like oftentimes, I mean, of course, like the, the bigger motivation for thinking about networks is think about alternate phylogenetic hypotheses. Oftentimes, these hypotheses come with like uh, some level of support that they have. And obviously there's some work that people have done doing like consensus trees when you have lots of trees mm. that have uh, various levels of support. Uh, but I wondered if any of that had sort of landed. And, and I, I understand it's not quite a discrete combinatorics problem in some ways, but at the same time, you could imagine there being, if you had sort of like a suitably simple uh, objective function, it could be, it could end up being like, I don't know, a polytope or some, you know, I guess yeah. what I'm trying to say is, is there an interesting problem that sort of like we have uh, lots of different hypotheses, each which comes with some real valued weight? Can we, mm -hmm. is there any nice theory that would uh, tell us like what is a network that maybe doesn't display every single one? of the hypotheses, but displays sort of like enough of the highly supported ones or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. It, it doesn't ring any bells, but I, I, but I will agree that I've brushed a lot. I have been, well, I haven't talked about biology at all today, to be fair. So, um, uh, and I think one thing I will say that I feel with the project networks business is that we, we still got a long way to go in some sense to come up with, as you would call, as I, and I agree, you know, to have good methods for building these where, where not, where a, the things that we build actually have some sense. Yeah. And B, as you say, maybe there's some statistical support for what we're doing. Okay. So actually part of the nice thing, I, I didn't want to keep coming back to it, but, with this, um, when we looked at the network space, what's nice there is that the, once you know you've got a cat zero space, you get all sorts of nice statistical properties where you can, so, so that actually gives you good ways to find a consensus for rooted things. And then you've got um, sort of like all this work that people have done of statistics in tree space. Now, whether that, um, you know, whether that helps uh, with the question you've asked me, maybe not but um i think in a sense yeah we do need to go more in that direction because one problem with networks is that you could keep throwing in more and more um edges can't you and you've got to have you've got to somehow control that of course there are things like information criteria and um people have done some you know, nice work on that Lue, nakle for example um or there's this thing called snap that's come out where they're trying to sort of include some statistical um Phenomena there, but I think I think there's just a lot of work to be done there. To be honest, Eric. Yeah. All right, uh, Hector. We should probably wrap up after this. But Hector yeah. Banyas has a question: uh, Would it make sense to extend re reconstructability by looking at quintets, etc.? Uh, I know some people have looked at quintets and sextets. Um, at least um, they've looked at it um, from the sort of sextets and quintets of trees. I mean, one one thing that um, one reason why I don't necessarily, I haven't done that so much, is that in the end, quintets can be split into quartets, yeah? Or, and when I looked at, um, for example, when you look at um, these circular partitions, um, you could think, well, I'll just look at partitions, but partitions can still be broken into splits. So yes, the answer is, yes, you could, you can, people have looked at quintets, sextets. Um, the question is, why why is that helpful and i think if you can justify why that's useful that would be that could be worth doing yes 
Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Vince. Uh, that was, thank again, you. a very clear talk, very interesting research. Um, and we'll, we've got one more network talk, and then I think we're going to be on to uh, pandemic scale phylogenetics. Great. Okay. Thanks very much, Eric. And thanks everyone who's attended. All right. Bye.